I will show a few graphs that I think just highlight some of the some of the challenges. A lot of what uh, David Nabarro said resonate highly with regards to our role because King's was initially there as a development organization that was helping the medical school, the ministry, uh, and the, the main referral hospital in the country in terms of its uh, challenges and, and ways to structurally improve things from the future. And we've had to quite rapidly adapt to setting up an isolation unit and, and uh, care and treatment for very ill patients. The <coughs> brief I was given to was to say, what have we learned from the start of the I break, where are we now, and um, um, wh what can we see in the future? So if we look just at this first graph here, uh, we've got, this is around mid-June when I was there, and up in the top left, we've got the number of cases, we've got deaths on the right, and the bottom left, we've got patients in treatment centers, bottom right, we've got contacts. There's really two things I want you to, to, to get from, from this graph, that's courtesy of Map Action, a small charity in the UK that produce uh, wonderful work like this. The first one is is that it is quite geographically distinct. Particularly, you can see the, the borders of, of the three countries in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, uh, where there was a sort of shared uh, ethnic population across all borders. So that one of the problems, I think, to begin with was that we treated this like a, it was a very specific country issue, when actually there were, there were shared uh, communities that, that, that were affected that didn't necessarily relate to, to population and geographic districts, and I think increasingly now as we see it spread more uh, widely, we have to very much take that into consideration. If you look at the number of cases up in the top left, we see that in the most affected areas we've got 200 to 250 cases. And then if you look down at the number of contacts being traced, which is in the bottom right, we see that at most we, we were getting maybe three contacts per, per case that were being followed up, that were being monitored for symptoms, that were being isolated if symptomatic. I think this is one of the, 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 the difficulties at, at the start, and I think, again, David Nabarro said very well that the, these are very overstretched health systems anyway, and there really just wasn't the, the infrastructure available to do mass contact tracing. And I think we need to learn from that, because that was one of the problems with, with, uh, with disease spread. Um, if we now look at where we are now, so we've got just the cases, and on the first, this is again map action on the left, we've got middle of June. And now we've got uh, one very recently from a few days ago. The big problem is is that that geographic spread is gone. That's a disaster because to begin with, <coughs> at a country level, you could do a risk assessment based on symptoms and where people had been and how they'd been in contact with someone with Ebola. The symptoms are very nondescript. They, they could mimic a, a hundred myriad illnesses they could be typhoid, they could be malaria, it could be any diarrheal illness, uh, they could be influenza. It, the challenge now is that we've lost that ability to, to have a geographical risk assessment. So the problems for anyone in any healthcare facility, not necessarily in the treatment facilities where people are diagnosed, but in all the, the remainder of the, of, the, of the health infrastructure, is trying to figure out who has got all of the diseases that already pre-existed that people are most certainly dying of at the moment and who has got Ebola, how do we appropriately use the facilities that we have for testing, for isolation, all the things that, that were mentioned as being, uh, as being difficult. And I think that is, is uh, one of the, the, the major challenges that we have at the moment, is trying to appropriately target uh, the very limited resources that we have. And then finally, this was recently published by the CDC, and this is a, a graph showing a number of new cases. The arrows and the, the different lines suggest what happens according to when we intervene at a, at a very high level and when we, we get that ramp up to the 10 and, and 20 fold increase that we see. And the axis uh, is, on the y-axis is number of new cases per day. So if we look at the lower level, that's if we really ramp up control strategies at the moment, we may just see a gradual increase in, in numbers of cases each day, but eventually that will plateau and tail off. If we delay that by a month, then we see a plateau again around January of next year, but it does plateau uh, and begin to tail off. If we delay until the end of next month, we don't have a plateau that the modeling suggests. We have an uncontrolled spread right through to January of next year. We have the CDC suggesting that up to 1.5 million people will be affected. And what I'm gonna show you just with this little line that I've put on it, this is assuming that we have a thousand bed treatment unit that we can drop into the country right now. If we 
had a thousand beds in August, the very first one of those little bars, that would have been able to adequately deal with, with the number of cases uh, that we were seeing. When we go into sort of mid-October time, that deals with the number of cases per day. And if we go right through to an uncontrolled spread with, with limited intervention uh, by, by the time we look into, into December, January time, we need every single day a 15,000 bed treatment center just to deal with the cases that day. That is horrifying, but that is the reality that we're seeing. And I think all I want to try and do briefly through these graphs is to illustrate that I think the, the, the collective action that we're seeing is, is absolutely wonderful, but it cannot be overstated that we need to intervene now. And what we need to intervene now is we need boots <coughs> on the ground in order to deal with logistics, deal with treatment, deal with isolation, deal with setting up these facilities. And challenging as it is, I think we need to do this in a sustainable way that will work for the future. What we don't want to do is set up parallel systems that will be irrelevant if we are able to control things I I in the short term. And uh, it's a very challenging way to think about things is how can you intervene acutely but in a sustainable manner. But I think we need to be, we need to be thinking about how we can invest in, in health system strengthening whilst we're, whilst we're doing this. And it does need to be a sustained response. And I think we all absolutely need to understand that, that this is going to be uh, in for a penny, in for a pound. We, we must commit to being there long term rather than uh, simple sort of jetting in and out. Uh, missions although technical expertise is, is absolutely valuable but we do need a sustained effort on the ground and we need to look at levers and incentives to get people both locally and internationally to to, to, uh, to go and help it certainly is true that the vast majority of people there are there for very good uh, reasons and we hope that that will be sustainable but if it's not we need to be looking at ways that that we can incentivize people to go because as you can see from 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 these efforts if we don't do something now then the numbers are truly terrifying. Thank you. Unbelievable. Exactly seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly seven minutes. <laughs> so um, he set the bar very high for the rest of the panel there. <laughs>